Hi, I'm with George Grun of uh, Grun Guitars, the founder and proprietor, and a, a very one of the most knowledgeable sources on acoustic instruments. Uh, and uh, Grun Guitars uh, was founded nearly 40 years ago and is in Nashville, Tennessee. And um, George, I'm, I thank you very much for seeing me, especially on IBMA weekend when you've got so much going on. Um, but anyway, I do appreciate the time. Uh, well, I'm giving pleased me. to do it. And obviously, since the IBMA trade show just ended, well, there's still concerts and other things. But that which was keeping me so occupied has ended. It's nighttime. Here we are, a bit past 7 p.m. Now, Grun Guitars was started. January 1970, so basically 40 mm -hmm. three quarter years ago yes. now, so almost 41. And in some ways, it's hard to believe that here it is at 40 and three quarter years. When I started out, I had no idea how long it would last or quite exactly where it would go, although I had a goal. I knew pretty much what I wanted to do, and a good bit of what I wanted to do has been done. I've managed to publish books and articles about guitars, Yes, spread more knowledge about them. When I started out, there were no books about vintage guitars, not any. Right. There were hardly even any articles about them. First article I ever saw about vintage guitars was one by John Lundberg in 1967 in the Denver Folklore Center's Almanac. They had a yearly almanac. And it was a two-page article about Martin guitars and mm -hmm. had a Martin guitar serial number list. And that was the first article I have ever seen about vintage guitars. It was specifically on the subject of yeah. vintage. And there was all of two pages, and there weren't even eight and a half by eleven size pages. Uh, it was a little almanac, but it did have a Martin serial number list, which is the first published Martin serial number list I have ever seen. Uh huh. So times have changed. Yes, the, the, the first one I ever saw was in Mike Longworth's um, C.F. Martin, a history book that came out about 1975, and that's the first time I saw serial numbers. Published. Um, well, we had serial numbers on the back of my business card in 1970. <laughs> yeah. And Martin, shortly after that, copied that for their business card. I see. <laughs> well, well, George, let me ask you. When um, I, I I heard that you were I don't know. To correct me if this is wrong, but I I am told that you were actually when you started out you were you were selling instruments out of literally out of the trunk of your car, or out of your apartment, or something before you started a shop. Is, is that well, I started collecting instruments in 1963 when uh -huh. I was a student at the University of Chicago, and it continued through graduate school. My undergraduate work was in animal behavior, uh -huh. and then I did graduate work in zoology at Duke for a year there, and then I switched to the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, to a professor that I had known when he was a graduate student at the University of mm -hmm. Chicago, and I was still an undergraduate. And that professor, Gordon Burkhardt, is still at UT Knoxville and is one of the world's leading authorities on reptile behavior. Uh -huh. I was particularly interested in reptiles. I started collecting snakes when I was eight years old. I still have 13 snakes, three lizards, and my parrot in the office, and they hear her chirping a bit. <laughs> so, but anyway. Um, so, anyhow, gosh, so you still, you still have got. Uh, you continue your interest in, in reptiles. As well, well, actually, as my approach to the guitars in many ways is not unlike the study of zoology. If you look at any of the books that I've written, particularly Grun's Guide to Vintage Guitars, mm -hmm. it is modeled after a zoological field guide. It just yeah. happens that it has North American fretted instruments instead. But if it were entitled Grun's Taxonomic Guide to North American Fretted Instruments, mm -hmm. It might befuddle some people with that title, but that's what it is. Yes, so you applied your approach to your uh, graduate studies to undo your interest in... Well, I can't really instrument. truly claim that I applied my approach to graduate studies because I started collecting snakes at age eight. Right. By the time I was 12, I was subscribing to Copia, the Journal of the American Society of Ichthyologists and mm -hmm. and 
I know almost as much about snakes as I do about guitars. <laughs> and a lot of that knowledge I had by the time I was 15. Mm -hmm. And I cannot claim that very much of that knowledge was acquired in either college or graduate yeah. school. My basic approach to the study of the instruments is modeled after a zoological approach. I organize these things into a Linnaean taxonomic system. I study their evolution. Yeah. I study their structure. And I view them very much as though they were alive. And in many ways, I feel like they are alive. To me, they are not simply inanimate objects. They have soul and personality. And they are responsive so that when you play it, it responds back very much as though it were alive. It doesn't simply do just mechanically what you put into it. It has personality of its own. And these instruments really, to some extent, work in partnership with the player. And just like if you think of Bill Monroe and his F5, exactly. when he started out in the 30s, well, started out before the 30s, but in the 30s as a professional, Player. Mm -hmm. That's when he started his career professionally. And he played uh, with the Monroe brothers, Charlie and Birch Monroe. He was on a F7. Right. One like just that. like that. Yeah. Same year, same model, look just like it. Yeah. And then in 42 or 3 is when he got his F5. And it was like Barbershop. that. Yes. Uh, July 9, 1923. That's the same day. Same signature date as Bill it's, Monroe's. That is like Bill's mandolin. And if you play that one and that one, you'll know why Bill, when he got that, <laughs> no longer used that. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I have um, I have an F7 that was re-necked, I think, by Randy Wood many years ago. And it, I think it improved the sound. It's a good sounding instrument, but it's not. It's probably somewhere between that and that as far as... Well, unfortunately, it's worth less money than yeah. if they've left it alone. I realize that, but yeah. it may be functionally, as a bluegrass tool, mm -hmm. improved, but there are so few original F7s... I know, people have converted that, a lot of them. Yeah, them. it's... Actually, not very many have been converted. Oh, okay. uh, I think the majority of F7s have been left alone, if only because they look a lot like what they look exactly like what Bill played in the 30s. Mm -hmm. And if you're good enough to re-neck it and do all the work, you're probably good enough you could have made the body too. Therefore, you can just make a mandolin from scratch. It doesn't yeah. really make good sense to convert something that is quite rare and valuable. Yeah, I think there was a time when, and this kind of bridges to my next question, because I think mine was done a long time ago. and. Maybe there was a point where these were considered maybe used instruments rather than something that maybe comes very valuable. Absolutely. Yeah, if you go back in time, uh, you don't have to go back, well, I said, I was going to say you don't have to go back all that far, but actually you have to go back over 40 years, but to me that doesn't seem very long. So, because uh, <laughs> yeah. to me, 40 years ago was when I was opening up, well, actually, 40 years ago, I'd already been in business for three quarters of a year. Yeah. It would be store, and these things were recognized as collectible by then. But if you go back even five years previous to that, mm -hmm. nope, they were not very collectible. They were tools. Yeah. And so times have changed. Absolutely. I'm, I'm imagining that in 1963, when you, when you became involved in, uh, in vintage guitars and mandolins, or guitars and mandolins, that maybe a 1940 Martin D28 probably sold for less than a new one at that time. Would that be an accurate statement? No, or? it sold for about as much. About as much. There people. were some people who at least were recognizing that these things were better than the new ones. Mm -hmm. You had to be in the right circle of folks, and you could still find some used ones for less than a new one. But for those in the know, they would pay as much as for a new one, uh -huh. but they wouldn't pay more. That's interesting, yes, because I remember when I first became interested in Martin guitars, my father bought me my first Martin when I was 17. It was a D35. That was in 1971. Not a banner year for Martin guitars. The, the, the ones from the 70s are not that highly regarded, but you know, to me it was just 
astonishing that he would buy me this. I'd been playing a Yamaha before that. And so I became interested, and then I started finding out there were Martins from the 1930s and 40s that were starting to get a lot of notice. Although at that time, they sold for what I thought were astronomical prices. I, I asked about a, a, a local store, had a D28 herringbone for sale, and I asked, how much is it? And they said, well, I hope you have lots of money. It's $1,700. So this is about 1975. So what seemed so ridiculously expensive, uh, you know, that guitar today would be worth probably well over twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. Know? More than that, yeah. if it was, uh, you, know, you can get what year again? That was a 46, actually. It a was 46, a dot. Yeah, it, yeah a a Civica Talk, so it wasn't the... Well, today, a, uh, that would be more like 25000 yeah. yeah, for a 46. But if you had a 40, mm -hmm. that could be more like fifty or $60,000. Keep in mind also, though, that 1974 or 5, the dollar bought more it, than yeah, it yeah. does now. So, there have been that many years of inflation, 75 to the present. You, you are, after all, talking about almost 36 years of inflation. Yeah. 35 and three quarter years of inflation from the beginning of 75 to the present. And prices have changed. Um, I remember very well buying a house in the mid 70s. I, bought land is within 15 miles of here for $1,000 an acre, <laughs> and I bought a house with five acres. It was, I think I paid $36,000 for a big stone house. It was, it was not a new house. It was mm -hmm. built in 36, but still, that and then buying the adjacent five acres for $1,000 an acre extra, you know, couldn't do that now. No. No, so, uh, $1,700 in 1975 for how old were you at the time? Oh, I was 21. And well, it might as well have been on the moon. Well, it would have <laughs> taken a long time. I mean, that's like saying that a D28 was $100 new without the case in the mid 30s, yes. right on up through 1940. Yeah. But for the average rural southern guy who wanted to play country music and mm -hmm. worked on the farm, what he got pay at the height of the depression in the rural south was a dollar a day. Yeah, so, so pretty relative. That one hundred dollars, uh, if he wanted to aspire to do things like eat and have a roof over his head in the meantime, coming up with a hundred dollars for a guitar was, uh, again, Michael had asked him to get a moon rock or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, I know, things, it's, it's very relative the way these values have increased over the years. It just seems like uh, vintage instruments have just grown exponentially. Like now it's, you know, as we were saying, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 and up even 100000 And in the case of a Lloyd Lohr F5, um, you know, $200,000 is not uncommon anymore. It's well, a very right now right. in today's economy, October 2010, getting 200,000 for a lore is not so easy. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, some of these things peaked where the bubble really was early to mid 2007 mm -hmm. and prices on some of these things are such it's very hard to sell them now for what they used to bring. Yeah, but there's still a whole lot more than they were, say, in the year 2000 mm. or 1999. Yeah. So they went up a lot. They've gone down where they're not bringing what they did at the peak of the bubble, but they haven't dropped down to what they were in 2000. Yeah. So looking at that, in many cases, even with today's rough market, many of these instruments have done better than real estate. <laughs> yeah, they many have. of them have done better than the stock market or mm -hmm. people's retirement funds where they had money in IRAs with mm -hmm. 401k accounts. And right. They find they've lost half of their retirement fund. Uh, and they 
paid people in commission to do that for them even. <laughs> um, and they didn't get to enjoy them with the instruments. You get to play them, fondle them, have fun with them, and you don't pay anybody a commission to have it go down in value. Uh, the fact is the guitars over the years that I've been in business have been an extremely good investment. Uh, acoustics and electrics. Mm -hmm. When I started out in 1963 at Herringbone D, it would have been about $250. That's amazing to think about. And it's just, you know, later in the 60s, they, I remember quite well actually, around 67 or so, 67, 68, I remember selling a Herringbone D in the 40s for $400 and throwing in a new case to make it worth it. <laughs> and but I remember also 1963-64, Sunburst Les Paul Gibson Standard from 1959. Would have been about $100 as a used guitar. Yeah. And today those things can be 200000 or more. And to think that some items in my personal experience from the time I started collecting to the present have gone from $100 sometimes $250,000. Yes. That's staggering. I mean, houses have gone up and other things have gone up. They didn't go up that much. There's very, 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 very few pieces that have gone up as much as the guitars have in the past yeah. 40, 40.